We're going to start the clinical informatics for varied electronic health record systems session now. We're, our, we're going to have our first talk for the State of Science and GAPS, Sandy Arison from Partners Healthcare. Thanks. I believe that clinical informatics is going to be increasingly critical to the point of potentially becoming a roadblock to the adoption, the proper use, and ultimately the efficacy and overall impact of genetic medicine. And it, compounding this, making it more complex, is the fact that clinical informatics is such a broad field with many different components that have to evolve in order to properly support the use of genetics. So what I'd like to do today is cover parts of clinical informatics that I think are most relevant to genetic medicine and share my views on where those parts are in their evolution in terms of moving towards providing our community the support that we desire. So the foundation of clinical informatics is the movement and acquisition of structured data. There are amazing thing ha things happening in the world of NLP, but I think in order for us to build a durable foundation for the kinds of support that we're after, we have to get more structured data moving through the clinical ecosystem. And that's really hard in the field of genetics. It's hard because we have providers often ordering from laboratories that are in different organizations using systems from different vendors than the provider uses. So we have to push increasingly structured information across these inter-organizational boundaries. And that, in turn, is hard because developing interfaces that are generalizable, broadly implementable, and reproducible is, in effect, a multi-dimensional problem. We need interfaces that are capable of transmitting data for many different types of genetic tests, many different types of data about each of those tests, many different scopes of data um, potentially that are relevant to transmit, and that's just the content that needs to be transmitted. Mechanistically, we need to establish um, technical, legal, and regulatory security context, need to establish actual methods of data transfer and formats for data transfer, and for fields that are particularly important to harmonize and structure well, we need to define the ontologies and the codes that we will use. So effectively, we need to cover all of these different areas in order to develop a fully robust, generalized interface between a laboratory and provider. Some, in some cases, for um, situations where the lab and the provider are using IT systems from the same vendor, it is possible to cover many, although to the best of my knowledge, no example where you can cover all of these bases. For situations where the lab and the provider are using different vendors, as far as I'm aware, there's no situation where even a majority of these different bases are covered, which means that what we have is a situation where those labs, when they um, establish these interfaces to the providers, there's a cost associated with that, which becomes a barrier, which means that not as much data moves through the ecosystem as we need to move in structured form, which in turn means that the whole rest of clinical informatics is less powerful than we need it to be. That doesn't mean that there aren't examples where clinical informatics is currently protecting patients in great ways. There are examples. Doesn't mean that as we move forward, we won't have increasing uh, number of use cases where that kind of support will be provided. It will. But it does mean that the scope of the impact in terms of the number of people that we can assist, the number of communities that we can assist, the number of clinical scenarios that we can assist, the number of places that we can assist, is severely limited by this lack of movement of structured data. So progress in this area is potentially um, valuable in a very generalizable way. So once data moves from the laboratory to the EHR, there are really two different scenarios for how it can be managed and processed. It can be placed directly into the EHR, probably in the most straightforward way to handle it. The disadvantage, though, is you're limited to the structures and the EHR's ability to receive and understand 
um, and manage that genetic data. Alternative is to interject a ancillary genetic system that actually receives the data from the laboratory, um, usually models it in a much more detailed way, and then just sends to the EHR the data that the EHR is capable of managing well. Both of these in use today um, and you know, can be implemented robustly. It's also worth thinking about where clinical interpretation of variants occurs. At present, it occurs in many different places, which leads to a scenario where it is difficult to ensure that um, the variant interpretations are maintained consistently across the ecosystem. In solving that problem, it requires the establishment of interfaces between the different sites where variant interpretations are maintained. Um, multiple barriers to that, technical barriers, barriers in, in terms of places wanting to keep data proprietary, but where these interfaces have been stood up, um, they've proven helpful. So once data is moving, it has to be displayed in the clinical environment. Again, multiple different ways to do that. As Kelly mentioned, you know, baseline scanner—you you have a PDF or, or scan fax coming in, getting placed into the EHR. It's probably going to be placed in a generalized section of the EHR, maybe a pathology section, but not managed as, you know, as an independent genetic result. Um, if stru a structured payload is sent into the EHR, then you can use whatever native capabilities the EHR has for managing genetic data. If an ancillary genetic system is involved, then you have the ability to establish a single sign-on transfer patient context interface, which essentially allows you to project displays into the electronic health record um, that seamlessly integrate with that environment, and then you can version and improve those displays independent of having to version the EHR itself. At this point, I did just want to mention that User interface design is an extremely difficult challenge throughout all of IT, but in particular in the clinical realm, it is very important. Um, it's important for ensuring that screens that are presented are intuitive and that when, data, when, when people look at data in those screens, they understand it properly, so they apply it properly. But it also is a multidisciplinary um, area, and therefore it can be expensive to pull together the different disciplines that you need to in order to develop good user interface designs. But I think it's something that in our area we really have to focus on more. Okay, so we're displaying the data. Now, in order to do more complete forms of clinical decision support, ideally we federate data together across institutions through networks and repositories. There are multiple different ways that that can be done. There's the model that ClinVar uses that eMERGE is um, going to use to set up its um, de-identified repository, multiple different entities sending data into a single repository, maybe a public repository, maybe a controlled repository. Other alternative is peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, both of these have advantages and disadvantages. I think that both are necessary in order to build out the ideal ecosystem. But in addition to the networking process, there's the question of the content that is shared. I think we as a community are doing an increasingly good job of sharing genetic knowledge. Um, there are some examples where aggregate data independent of cases are being shared to assist um, clinicians. Um, but I think that the real holy grail here is to find ways to share individual case data that can drive more complete forms of analysis and clinical decision support. With an eMERGE, looking at ways of sharing genetic results, <clears throat> phenotypes, indications, but the, to, to truly get to what we want here, we really want to get to outcomes. And that becomes incredibly difficult for multiple different reasons, one of which is the de-identification and security context that you need to set up in order to make sure that you're appropriately securing and protecting the patients within the, these, these repositories. This is an area where it will be incredibly exciting to see what comes out of the um, precision medicine initiative and how that um, helps the clinical informatics field in general. So all of this is focused on leading to clinical decision support um, and really assisting 
um, the way that clinicians make decisions. Two different kinds of clinical decision support. Um, there's passive decision support, where you're essentially augmenting displays that clinicians navigate to with more functionality. Um, a number of people here, Casey, Mark, others, have been real drivers of the creation of e-resources info buttons that enable clinicians to drill down um, from information in the EHR, often in patient context-specific ways to get more information about the data that they're seeing. Um, it's possible to add annotations um, to screens in the EHR, which can be helpful. Different calculators can be hooked up to help with risk assessment, dosing. Um, and an area that I think many folks here, including myself, are extremely excited about is population-based analytics, poten potentially actually real-time population-based analytics that could be integrated into clinical displays, give information like, if I was to run this genetic test on this patient, what's the likelihood that I would find a variant that would be significant? You know, how is creatinine likely to trend in this patient with or without intervention? If I release this patient today, what's the likelihood that they'll be readmitted? Lots of amazing things that people are beginning to start to look at doing um, in the EHR environment. And then you have active um, clinical decision support where you actually are going to proactively interrupt the clinician's workflow um, with information that you think is particularly important. Um, perhaps the lowest hanging fruit in this area has been pharmacogenomic interventions. Um, these are being, so Digitize is working actively in this area. A number of different places have these stood up and working today where clinician orders a drug. If there's no evidence that the clinician has ordered a needed pharmacogenomic test before ordering that drug, the system alerts them. If there's evidence, if, if the result from a pharmacogenomic test contraindicates that drug order, the system also alerts them. Specific areas where, um, where those are being stood up. We found knowledge update alerts to be extremely useful. So situations where a variant has previously been identified in a patient, new information is learned about that variant that could potentially be impactful to that patient's clinical care, sending the clinician a proactive alert. And CSER and Digitize, um, the CSER EHR working group and Digitize are working together to create an example of a risk-driven reminder. So in this case, working on identifying which patients have a genetic predisposition to Lynch syndrome and therefore you know, should have um, reminders for colonoscopies go every two years as opposed, to, um, as opposed to every 10. So I think overall in this space, we really are just at the beginning of the beginning. And yet already material ways that clinical informatics is um, helping patients, um, helping to protect patients. Um, so I think it's really exciting to think about where we can go um, in this space going forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Next, we have Casey Overby from Johns Hopkins. 